kind of thing like vibration as it's coming in this game, or you're going to go to this line. And your voices, as well as the cell phone conversations, could easily be heard over the microphone. We thank you again for attending this session, and we hope you enjoy yourself at St. Louis Public Library. You ready, Joe? Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining us for the third and final of three fall lectures of the 2023 Society of Architectural Historians St. Louis Chapter, St. Louis Public Library, Stedman Architectural Library Lecture Series. On behalf of the St. Louis Public Library, Stedman Architectural Library, we are pleased to continue our collaboration with the Society of Architectural Historians St. Louis Chapter and host this lecture series. Before we begin, we ask you to please mute your devices should you have any questions, please hold your questions until the conclusion of Andrew's talk. If you're joining us via Zoom, please type them into the Q&A section. After our talk tonight, we will pose your questions and your Ramos if time allows. And now I'd like to introduce John Gunther, FAIA Lead AP, an architect who serves as president of the Society of Architectural Historians St. Louis Chapter. He'll introduce our speaker for this evening's talk. John. Thank you, Trent, for your welcome and for hosting this talk. Please know how appreciative we are to the St. Louis Public Library, Stedman Architectural Library, for our continued collaboration for our lecture series. It's wonderful to be here for our third in-person lecture in our fall lecture series. Trent, we thank you, Renee Jones, Joe Schwartz, and your colleagues for making all the arrangements to host us in person again. And now it is my privilege to introduce our speaker tonight, Andrew Ramist is an architect, historian, writer, and photographer. He's also a longtime friend and colleague. Andrew and I co-founded and co-taught Architecture 478A, Mid-Century Modernism in St. Louis, 1930 to 1970, when we were lecturers in the College of Architecture, Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts, Washington University in St. Louis in 2011, 2012, and 2013 with the belief that experiencing architecture is the best way to learn and appreciate it, we held our classes on site at various iconic mid-century buildings in St. Louis. Chief among them was the Mr. and Mrs. John P. Meyer residence in Huntley, Missouri, a masterful design by Eames and Walsh architects, 1936 to 1938, and a pivotal project in the career of Charles Armand Eames, Jr., 1907 to 1978 of St. Louis. Andrew Ramist is a St. Louis based architect, photographer and writer. He is now preparing a Charles Eames biography addressing his early years as an architect entitled Becoming Charles Eames. The book examines his early life and career in light of his later California designs in collaboration with Ray Kaiser. Andrew's architectural work addresses mid-century modern architecture and its preservation. His research focuses on the early development of 20th century modernist architecture through writing, photography, and speaking. Ramist earned a bachelor's degree from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, and a master's degree from Washington University in St. Louis. He's earned grants from the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts, the Missouri Arts Council, and the American Institute of Architects. Andrew Ramist has pursued his research on Eames, exploring his life and early works visiting each of his projects, photographing and understanding them through his lens as an architect, historian, writer, and photographer. Tonight, Andrew will focus on Charles Eames' career in the 1930s. He notes that just as we value studies of the early works of modern masters like Le Corbusier, Mies van der Rohe, and Frank Lloyd Wright, we similarly need to consider Eames's early work for indications of his design methods and philosophies. In particular, Andrew has closely studied the Pilgrim Congregational Church. This church was important to Eames personally as well as his family. It is where he married Catherine Worman in 1929 at the age of 22. 
Eames became the church's in-house architect and designer for the next nine years. Andrew examine, examines Eames' work in context of his notion, the details are not the details, and applies this principle to his work on churches of the 1930s. Eames created additions and alterations for two St. Louis churches. He also designed two other churches from the ground up for the Catholic Diocese of Little Rock in Arkansas cities located near the Mississippi River. Andrew has documented these works in detail and will illuminate Eames' design process and its results, suggesting links to his later work in connection with form, symmetry, structure, and symbols. And now, please welcome Andrew Ramist as he presents Charles Eames' ecclesiastical work, 1932 to 1936. Thank you very much, John and Trent and Joe. I appreciate all of your help, and I appreciate everyone coming uh, to be here tonight, and everyone that's watching on Zoom or in, and on YouTube. Um, I have a whole list of people that I'd like to thank. I've been working on this project for a number of years. Um, a few people who have been important have been John Gunther, Esley Hamilton, Christina Impostato, Laura McNewman, and other archivists and librarians uh, who have aided my research. Um, I was fortunate to take photographs for the Eames Institute. Um, they asked me to document his St. Louis work, and that launched me onto this project uh, because I had time to spend looking at these projects in detail. One of the ways that people disregard this period of Eames' work is they look at the houses, they look at the churches, and they say, well, it looks pretty traditional. It's really not very innovative. Um, you know, compared to what Mies and Corbu were doing at the time, it's sort of a 19th century thing. My argument is that the context of the entire building may follow a traditional form. However, when we look at the details of the furniture, the light fixtures, uh, the carvings, the pews, the altars, we see flashes of Eames' inspiration in geometry and color and form that resonate throughout his career. So that will be the focus of my talk, is the details. And I will come back to his quote, the details are not the details. As a way of introducing my talk, I want to speak a little bit about the context. All of these works were produced during the Great Depression. Eames had just left school, just got married, started an architectural firm. They struggled to get projects. Some of his most uh, dedicated clients were the church where he was married and where his family uh, worshiped, the Pilgrim Congregational Church. That is the subject of my detailed article that I will share with everyone uh, after the conclusion of the talk. Um, there were many times when Eames struggled, just as any other architect or artist uh, trying to do work that they believe in, um, he had times where he had no work and struggled to uh, pay bills. At one point, he had an office in the Central West End and he would often spend all night long working on drawings and presentations and models to present to clients. 
and he didn't have time to go all the way back to his home to take a shower and change clothes. So he was able to uh, go to the home of his friend, Frederick Dunn, who lived nearby, and they gave him the opportunity to take a shower and change his clothes and freshen himself up before going to meet with clients, just like so many other people have done countless times. In 1932, a lot of work dried up and he and his partners began volunteering for doing set designs for the municipal opera in Forest Park, which was a summer theater. Um, and he got incredibly invested in doing these set designs and it, it carried out through the rest of his career, his focus on presentation, lighting, and uh, context. When they were designing sets, they had one opportunity, the very last performance of 1932 in the summer was a newly commissioned opera of Cyrano de Bergerac. The Schuberts had commissioned uh, a new uh, composer to create this kind of a light opera uh, musical. And it was a very great success. It was the world premiere of this opera. Uh, the Schuberts were there and the, comp the composer was there and the papers wrote all sorts of wonderful things about it. And the Muni, the municipal opera, put this same production on several times over the course of the 1930s. At the end of the season, Eames didn't have much work and the Schuberts asked him if he would go follow the production as it, perform it was performed in other cities like Cincinnati and Pittsburgh and uh, elsewhere, ultimately ending up in New York City. And he said, yeah, that would be great. And so he did. He ended up in New York uh, after setting up the sets over and over and the play was a tremendous flop and closed fairly shortly. So he was in New York City uh, during the depression without work and he tried to get whatever work he could and he met other artists and architects uh, at the time. Sometimes he had to sleep outside in Central Park and just scrounge up enough money to be able to get a sandwich and a cup of coffee. Um, and then I think he got a telegram saying, we've got the biggest commission that we've ever had, come back. And he had a train ticket waiting for him at the station and he came back. The project that they worked on, which he invested incredible amounts of energy into, was for a very big house on a five acre lot in Ladue. And they wanted something early American. And he believed very much in working within the constraints of the client, what society needs, and what the designer believes. Uh, after working on this for months, uh, the client got cold feet and said, well, you know, I'd really rather spend less money. I suspect his business, which was booming, had a drop in uh, sales. So they said, could you just do something simpler? And uh, so Eames' partner sketched up a nice little colonial, and that's what they decided to go with. Eames was furious. He ultimately quit the firm, left St. Louis, left the United States, and went to travel in Mexico for eight months to explore what it is he really wants to do and accomplish with his life. And he did a lot of work on churches while he was in Mexico. He often stayed uh, at churches uh, and did work uh, painting statues, murals, 
putting gold leaf on domes and similar kinds of things. And I think when he came back to St. Louis after that on the road tour, he was incredibly focused. So most of the work that you'll see here was done after his travels in Mexico. I'm going to show you a lot of images, uh, not unlike some of uh, Eames' presentations. So please forgive me if I don't speak about every single picture. There are four churches that he worked on in the 1930s. This is Pilgrim Congregational Church where he was married and he was essentially the in-house architect uh, for the duration of his years living in St. Louis and did a number of projects important to the church. This is St. Mary's Catholic Church in Helena, Arkansas, which is a new structure from the ground up. This is also, see, oh, this one in the lower right is the St. Mary's Catholic Church in Paragol, Arkansas, which is another church he designed from the ground up. And then this is Trinity Episcopal Church in St. Louis in the Central West End, where he was hired to do work and not that much was materialized. So. Let's look first at Pilgrim Congregational Church, then St. Mary's Church, then St. Mary's in Paragold, and Trinity. Pilgrim Church is in St. Louis. It was the family church for Catherine Warman and her father. Her father was a civil engineer who graduated from Washington University and she was an architecture student. And that's where they met at Washington University. The projects he did for Pilgrim involved the narthex doors and transoms, a chancel chandelier. Those were the projects in the early 1930s before his trip to Mexico, which was in 1933, 1934. St. Mary's is in Helena which is on the Mississippi River and has many old French and European uh, communities that uh, generally came up from Louisiana and New Orleans. All of this work was done after his return from Mexico. In, as a matter of fact, the, the St. Mar Mary's Catholic Church in Helena was the first real project that he got when he came back. After he was working on the church in Helena, a church in Paragol decided that they would demolish their church in order to build a new one designed by Eames. And that was also after Mexico. The Trinity Episcopal Church is an old structure that was actually moved to its current location and had several different names and denominations over time. It's a beautiful church and has a tremendous amount of history. They designed a choir loft, which remained unbuilt. They created a portable altar, which you'll see, and then Eames designed the support for a uh, life-size crucifix of Christ. And that was also all after his travels in Mexico. Then there were two more projects for Pilgrim. He did uh, alterations to the tower and then an exterior sign. And that would be the last project that he did prior to leaving for Cranbrook. Here are some of the details. 
And this is the motto. The details are not the details that I am using to inform my investigation. You can see here the interior. The building was designed in 1906 by Moran, Russell, and Garden Architects, following Beaux-Arts principles. 1906 was one year before Eames was born in St. Louis. This is what the church looked like uh, at the time it was constructed. The major changes in the roof of the tower. So in June 1929, Charles and Catherine Warman were married. Her father paid for a European honeymoon for them on the scale of the Grand Tour. Uh, Eames did a number of drawings and etchings uh, documenting their trip. Here's Notre Dame in Paris and Mont Saint Michel. The first project at Pilgrim he was asked to work on were these pairs of narthex doors into the sanctuary. They fit within existing openings. You can see there's a pattern of recessed squares with circular cutouts around them. And that becomes the central theme. And the image of these doors from the inside and from the outside of the sanctuary is rather different. You get a different quality of light, uh, warmer and cooler, depending on uh, the time of day and the direction you are looking. Now that door design was something Eames had developed while he was an apprentice architect working for True Blood and Graph Architects. In just the year before, 1930 and 1931. This is a rendering that Eames did uh, with his initial COE, sort of hidden in the landscaping, uh, which was published in a book documenting True Blood and Graph Architects work the entire book is filled with photographs, except for the very last project in the book, which is this drawing. It's not shown as a photograph. Uh, this Meyer, Alfred Meyer is the older brother of John Philip Meyer. They were both involved with banking and finance. The design for the door that Eames settled on was this design with recessed squares with circles and that's how it was constructed. However, unfortunately that little bar from Zoom is blocking the view, but you can see that there is a light that someone has put uh, stained glass into the door and it does not fit the geometry. It's a rectangle, it's got sort of traditional moldings around it and a sill on it, and it just spoiled the whole effect that Eames was going for. So when he had the opportunity to design these doors for Pilgrim, he took up this challenge to design the door with stained glass lights integrated into the design he may have been inspired in part by the design of the clock on the tower, which uses that square and circle format. Uh, it's also a puzzle from ancient Greek mathematicians who challenged one another to use only a compass and a straight edge, which were the limits of mathematics at the time, to create a circle and a square of exactly the same area using a finite number of steps. And this is a puzzle that has uh, challenged many people for centuries. Here you can see the narthex doors open with a view to the altar where Charles and Catherine were married. The 
chancel chandelier that hangs over the altar was not there originally when they were married. A member of the congregation had visited Venice and was incredibly impressed with this uh, Romanesque era hanging uh, at St. Marco Basilica, which was a bronze uh, hanging uh, coming down from one of the domes, and it had dozens and dozens of these little oil lamps all around it. Uh, Eames was challenged to incorporate electrical lighting into that open work structure and decided to do that with two cylinders, a wider flat cylinder and a taller uh, cylinder below. There is the ball. You can see the amount of detail invested into this. And he particularly put a tremendous amount of detail into the elements that he inserted into the historic fixture which would uh, be lit by the electric lighting. He probably was working off of perhaps some drawings uh, or old postcards at the time. So his level of precision was impressive and he had to scale down this uh, monumental piece to fit the church. This is a view looking directly up <clears throat> into the fixture, <clears throat> excuse me, and you can see how he created uh, a kind of donut with two down lights shining down on the altar. There you can see a 3D view, and you can see that there are a series of medallions around the central um, section of the fixture. And here are some of those details. And you can get a sense of its appearance when lit. And you can see that the bottom surface, although it looks like it's metallic, is actually a glass that's uh, covered with a bronze uh, coating, which allows for translucent light to penetrate it. So remember, the details are not the details. They make the design. These were some of his sketches uh, and watercolors that he did while in Mexico. He was there for eight months. And when he came back, there was a full page uh, article in the Post-Dispatch with several of his watercolors and account of his time there including uh, twice ending up in jail. The church in Helena was probably like a godsend uh, because when he came back from Mexico, he had no real prospect of work. He went back to his old boss, True Blood. They had dissolved their firm due to lack of work. However, True Blood was head of the uh, HABS, the Historic American Building Survey, uh, and Eames worked on documenting the old cathedral downtown, houses in St. Genevieve, as well as the cathedral in New Orleans. On the right is the photograph of the church as it was published in 1936. This photograph was published in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. It apparently was published in a magazine, but I have not ever been able to locate that magazine. So if anyone listening has an idea where this magazine is, uh, it is said to be architectural form, but I have not found it there. <clears throat> On the left is my photograph from a very similar vantage point. You can see the detail in the statue, which was done by a St. Louis sculptor named Carolyn Risk Janus. She had studied in Paris. It's sometimes attributed to another sculptor, but that is incorrect. 
you can get a sense of the uh, precision used in the detailing of the brickwork. Uh, the masons and contractors for the project were a family that came from Czechoslovakia who had a long tradition of building churches going back to the Middle Ages. And they were incredibly impressed by this big city architect who actually knew how to lay bricks and could indicate to them exactly how they needed to be laid, where, and why. This image on the left is the uh, side entrance into the south, I'm sorry, the north transept. You can see some of the light fixtures and beams that are in the narthex of the church. Eames was working with symbols of the sun and the moon and stars. So he has these globes <coughs> which cut out stars in the upper portion. These are smaller light fixtures which are in the, the narthex and in the choir loft. Larger fixtures align with the stained glass windows, hang down, and offer this image of the night to uh, the congregation while they're in uh, seated in their pews. Um, the design is such that after you go up and you take communion, that sunlight then appears. So there is a symbolic uh, <clears throat> aspect to the design which works both functionally as well as uh, emotionally. The most controversial aspect of this church is the mural that was painted uh, behind the altar. Um, there were some beautiful uh, altar rails which were removed after Vatican II and have been reassembled in part uh, in some of the transepts. The mural was done by a painter from St. Louis, Charles Quest. He was a professor of painting at the Washington University Fine Arts School. And he worked in abstract cubist designs. He did this at the specific request of the priest, Father Martin, who wanted this church to hearken back to early Christianity, to the Byzantine period of mosaics and very simple figures. Um, my understanding is that the congregation did not like this uh, mural. Uh, the church was finished in 1936 and Father Martin passed away a few years later. They then decided we need to get rid of this mural. Uh, some people wanted to remove it, paint it over. They ultimately decided to hang heavy velvet drapes over it, though those drapes remained in place through uh, the mid 1970s. When it was opened and looked at, there had been so much moisture damage coming through the solid brick masonry walls that it was covered with mildew, mold, the paint was all peeling and uh, it was in terrible condition. So once again, the congregation discussed removing it or uh, painting it over, just painting it white or something. Um, a professor of art history uh, looked into this and found Charles Quest and his wife Dorothy had retired to North Carolina. They were living in an artist community there. Uh, it took many years uh, until there was an effort to restore the mural. Charles Quest actually left money in his will to pay for the restoration of this mural, as well as the restoration of the altarpiece he did for the old cathedral, which was a highly realistic rendition of a Velasquez uh, crucifixion. And that has also been restored. You can see here some examples of the stained glass work that was done by the Emil Fry Studio. 
and Eames worked closely with them on this project and the others. They did the stained glass for the narthex doors at Pilgrim Church. I think we're doing fine. So remember about the details. They're not just the details. Then we go to Paragold. Paragold is north of Helena. It's actually very close to the boot heel of Missouri. <clears throat> the most impressive aspect of this church for me is the stained glass. I believe that the budget for this church was significantly less than the church in Helena. That led them to a more abstract use of glass, color, and form, uh, which is actually incredibly beautiful. The church is more of a Romanesque-derived uh, church, and it has this tower that rises over the crossing before the altar. Over the tower, there is a rooster with... Uh, uh, weather vane and north, south, east, west indicated. You can see here the facade and the location. Uh, Missis uh, the Helena was right on the Mississippi River where people coming up the river who were new immigrants from Europe often arrived and the church was positioned in Helena so that it was the very first thing people getting off the boat would see. This church in Paragold was more of a neighborhood church, but the congregation decided to demolish their existing church and they, have a, they had a school there and they still have a school there. And every morning they would have the children and faculty carrying bricks from the brickyard to the building site uh, for, for a year uh, to get this church constructed. Um, there's a little side chapel which has this open archway. Uh, originally, this open archway held a crescent moon, but was removed as apparently considered sacrilegious by one of the priests. This is the uh, transept entry door. The original wooden doors had decayed so much they cast impressions uh, and then had bronze replicas put in place. This is a grid of stained glass. Each one is just eight inches by eight inches, um, which is located over the main entry. And it's where you might have seen a rose window. It lets diffuse light into the choir loft and the organ loft. And you can see the degree of uh, precision and beauty that uh, went into creating this pattern of stars overlooking the congregation. The altar here is much simpler, but the stained glass, I think, is particularly beautiful. These are special windows in the chapel dedicated to St. Mary. Our Lady of Perpetual Help, it reads. I was curious about this tower. Uh, the priest uh, gave me full run of the church, locked the door and said, go ahead and take as many pictures as you want. So he showed me where you can climb up to get to the tower, um, which is this little shaft where you see some uh, translucent glazing. There was a steel, uh, steel ladder embedded into the rough brickwork 
and I climbed up with my camera. Um, it, it was a little nerve wracking. Um, the light coming in through those translucent glazing then shed light from these stained glass uh, elements into the upper part above the altar. When I reached the top, <clears throat> I found the bells. And unfortunately, the video is not plain, um, but I was shocked by the massive volume. Just as I hit the top rung, these bells started to ring. And uh, I, w <laughs> I was scared, but I held on tight and pulled out my camera and took a short video. Um, unfortunately, it's not showing for us, but it was incredibly loud, I can promise you. Trinity Church was the church where Charles Eames' older sister, Adele, was married. She married a uh, reverend, uh, Reverend Vincent Chesley Franks. And so he had a personal connection to this church and they asked him to design a choir loft. The choir loft was shelved. And then they said, well, we would like to have a portable altar. And he decided that it would be uh, constructed of gum wood, which is a very lightweight wood. And they still use this altar and they take it outdoors and they relocated to other locations throughout the church and use it quite extensively. The same painter worked on painting these uh, decorations, Charles Quest, and there's a particular uh, similarity in these angels and the lettering uh, from both the Helena Church and this church in Trinity. This is uh, part of the blueprints for the choir loft, which remained unbuilt. But they did uh, have a greater than life size uh, crucifixion sculpture that a uh, member of the congregation, Victor Berlendis, uh, he was a sculptor and he created this. And then they asked Eames to create the framework to support it. And then uh, Charles Quest painted it. Um, so you can see what it looks like today, which is somewhat different than it appeared originally. But the church was so uh, enthralled that they decided they would leave all of the lights on, leave the door unlocked 24 hours a day so that everyone in St. Louis could come and appreciate some very special stained glass windows and this uh, peace on Christ as an Episcopal priest. So we'll remember that the details are not just the details. Now he has two more projects at Pilgrim Church. One is the tower and the other is the exterior sign. There was an event um, Friday, July 12th of 1935, that there was this tremendous lightning storm that struck all across the St. Louis area. There were five houses that were struck and burned down. One man in Illinois died when he was struck and there was a huge, I think 10,000 gallon uh, gasoline tank in Monsanto, Illinois, which ignited. Uh, the tower of Pilgrim Church was struck twice, but it did not start a fire. There were several articles in the newspapers, this one showing a few young men pointing at the hole in the roof, and everyone was amazed that there was no fire, but there was a lot of concern that the church would be hit by lightning again. Uh, Eames' father-in-law was the head of the building committee for Pilgrim, and he immediately climbed the tower, started drawing up 
how to make the repairs and doing a detailed cost estimate. These are from his collected papers, which come from the State Historical Society of Missouri. Um, they were incredibly gracious in sharing many documents with me. So you can see what the old roof looked like. It had four dormers, it was octagonal, extremely complex, and he estimated, Warman estimated, that half of the cost would be spent just on replacing the slate. So Eames proposed to lower and simplify the roof dramatically. He suggested removing this uh, roof entirely to create a more, in a lot of ways, a lot, a lot more appropriate roof, which fits the Italianate character of the church versus the kind of older Victorian style of the complex roof. So this is Eames' sketch, uh, which was accepted. It was seemingly drawn just within a week of uh, the drawings and cost estimates for repairing the roof, and he convinced the church that they ought to remove all of that and put something much simpler. He designed the new lightning rod and cross. His last project for Pilgrim Church was an exterior sign. It was a lighted sign. Uh, so it was meant to communicate to the public. This is on Union Boulevard, uh, north of Forest Park. The church was a very important uh, anchor in the neighborhood. Uh, which was filled with uh, huge mansions of incredibly wealthy uh, patrons and members of the congregation. So they wanted to show their name and do it in a way that was appropriate to the building. Eames decided to use this kind of Gothic lettering that harkened back to older styles and used bronze plates which were punched and scored and embossed uh, to create this design. Now, I do not know exactly what it looked like originally. This is a recent restoration where they've highlighted the lettering and the horizontal bars uh, with gold. Um, however, uh, originally, or when I first saw it, it looked like this. That was around 1993, uh, when I very first started documenting Eames' work in St. Louis. Um, so I don't know what evidence there is to suggest that this is what the original sign looked like. Um, but I think it is beautiful, and I would absolutely suggest everyone to drive by, if you're in St. Louis, uh, to see it. There's a closer detail. And this was also a short video clip that shows how the sign projects from the facade and you can see beside it what used to be the St. Louis Artist Guild, uh, which is a beautiful building. It has been entirely restored uh, for a new uh, venture, which is called the Boo Cat Club, um, which puts on you know weddings and all sorts of other events. You absolutely should go and check it out. Uh, when I was there photographing the sign, there was one limousine after another and people walking in and out with, you know, impressive gowns and tuxedos going into an event at the uh, Bouquet Club. Eames uh, was a member 
of the St. Louis Artists Guild and exhibited his work there and he did win uh, some prizes for his drawings. Um, I've been looking into those works and found some documents at the St. Louis Art Museum in their archive and I'm continuing to search. There are uh, lists of the drawings that he made, uh, but there are only a few that I've been able to identify uh, as specifically being done by him. Uh, there was one drawing which he submitted to a competition that the St. Louis Post-Dispatch held every year for black and white drawings of the city of St. Louis. Eames chose uh, as the subject the, it was called at the time, the Bell Telephone Building. It subsequently became better known as the Southwestern Bell Building and is now referred to as 1010 Pine, um, which is a gorgeous building. It was, at the time, it was built in the 1920s, the tallest skyscraper in the state of Missouri. And Eames renders the building in a, a lovely way where he shows sort of the grime and details and mess that you see on the ground of the two and three story brick structures along the street. And then this white gleaming tower. He picks the side of the building, which is entirely blank. The building was proposed to be built in phases and it was to have a cruciform shape. That second phase was never constructed. So for many, many years, it was just a blank brick wall. And I think in the last couple of decades, they put stone sheathing on it. But Eames had a particular interest in showing sort of the backstage, the functional parts of buildings. So for example, he did some work near Union Station and I believe that the Victorian monument, which is the head house by Theodore Link, was probably not his uh, favorite part of Union Station. I'm convinced that the shed was his real fascination, that and the trains themselves. He was fortunate that he grew up visiting Union Station because his father was a head of security for Missouri Pacific Railroad. And he had an office that was suspended as if in a cage overlooking all of the tracks. And he knew the timetables of the trains when there was money and gold and silver being transported so that he could track those things and when there were criminals that were under armed guard uh, coming to be tried uh, in St. Louis. Um, so Eames got to visit the sort of backstage parts of Union Station, the corridors and the tunnels and uh, walk paths through the structure. Um, and so it ultimately held a very strong place in his heart, uh, which I believe contributed to his later fascination with toy trains and um, trains in general, uh, which was a theme that he uh, carried on throughout his life. Um, I have put together this PDF of my essay on Pilgrim Church. Unfortunately, the link is not working right now, so I'm not going to show that to you. However, anyone who would like to get that PDF can go to andrewramist.com, and I will have a link there that you can download the PDF 
uh, I've gone into a great deal of detail about some aspects of his personal life and the planning and discussions involved in the projects that he did for Pilgrim Church. Um, so in sum, my emphasis again is on the details. I think when you look at the churches and you take a picture of the outside, you say, mm, yeah, okay, it's, it's a church. Uh, it's got a steeple, it's got a cross, uh, it's got a statue of Mary. Um, yeah, maybe it's kind of plain. The brickwork is very flush and smooth and very detailed, but not in a way that is three-dimensional. It's more of a flat plane. Um, and Eames was convinced that this church would launch him for the rest of his career. And apparently, Eliel Saarinen saw this church in photographs and was mightily impressed and invited Eames to come to Cranbrook, which was the major turning point in his life, which is where he and Errol Saarinen won the organic furniture competition at MoMA, and he met Ray Kaiser. They married and left for California, and essentially, uh, as Eames Demetrius would say, the rest is history. Um, I would be very happy to take any questions that people have. I've left a little bit of time here at the end so that uh, we're not rushed. Yes. Andrew, I have a, a couple of questions on the, the Pilgrim uh, doors. Yes. Um, my first question is, why do they need to be replaced in the first in the first instance? And the other question is, the um, square within the circle it looked like they they weren't really exactly circles, but almost. I mean, at least to the yes. The you're you're correct. Um, okay, I do not know the reason why the doors had to be replaced. However, I read the cost estimates and some of the correspondence, and they did decide to keep the door closers and hinges and the door stops and the push plates um, and install them on the doors that Eames designed. Um, the exact fabrication of those doors and the square and the circle um, is not clear to me. It does appear in the photographs that there are arcs that may not be uh, part of a circle, but I actually want to go back there and take some measurements and then compare them to the door at uh, the Alfred Meyer house which is still existing. It's uh, off of Clayton Road in St. Louis County. Um, so that door on the Meyer house had three columns and um, I think nine, I'm sorry. Yeah, three columns and nine rows. So there were quite a number of recessed squares and circles. Uh, for the Pilgrim doors, there are 12. And I think he came to that partly um, because it just looked right and looked beautiful and had the benefit of maybe reflecting the 12 apostles. Um, I would suppose that he was uh, happy to have any supporting logic to support his designs. Um, and this came to him partly from his father, who had been injured as a security person working for the railroads. He had been tracking down a train robber and been shot uh, in 1914 when Eames was seven years old. And Eames had to uh, 
start doing jobs to help uh, support the family. They had to sell their house in South St. Louis on Russell and move to rented quarters in North St. Louis on Greer. And they actually had to move several times um, during those years. He ultimately attended Yeatman High School. Um, so I don't know the reason why the Narthex doors had to be replaced. There are actually four pairs of doors. There are three pairs that go into the sanctuary and one which admits people from the vestibule at the base of the tower. And uh, the transoms are particularly beautiful. So I would suggest to check those out. Other questions? Yes. I just wanted to mention that in that beautiful narthex that the, that the doors open out of, there's a plaque that's dedicated to all the men of that congregation who served in World War I. And listed on that plaque is Mr. Mormon and several of Eames's clients for the houses that he designed also. Yes. So, that's something that I have been investigating. I just was reading again about uh, James Skelly. Uh, Eames did a beautiful uh, sort of arts and crafts style house in University City for him. And he had served under uh, General Pershing in World War I. And there's an account of his uh, recollections that are in the Missouri Historical Society and a beautiful portrait of him, and Eames designed the house. I, I imagine that having lived through, he, he was uh, an engineer, and his job was to lay out these lightweight rail systems to transport food, clothing, medicine, uh, tents and other things, ammunition, to the troops. And I'm sure that they were constantly under bombardment, and he probably had uh, terrible uh, dreams. And so Eames designed this house for him. And that it seems that the house was mostly paid for by someone else. Um, Warman built the house for him. And when Skelly moved into the house, he accepted Skelly's own house in trade. And then Skelly made $25 payments monthly for I think about six or seven more years throughout the 1930s. Skelly retired and became a painter. Eames designed a high ceilinged studio with lots of natural light. Uh, and it's designed almost like a separate wing of the house. And it's located directly above the garage. And this has puzzled me um, because it looks a little bit odd. This particular part of the house has buttresses and a shallow brick relieving arch. The whole garage is built from poured concrete. So essentially it's like a bomb shelter. And Skelly had his artist studio above the garage, and I imagine that he might have gone down to the garage in times when there were storms and tornadoes and similar things. Um, Eames had a strong relationship with all of his clients. When Skelly moved into that house, Eames presented him with an etching of the Scottish Rite Cathedral, which uh, Skelly was the, for a time, he was the Grand Master of the Scottish Rite Cathedral. Uh, and it's another connection with Eames' father, who had served in the Civil War, but he was also a Mason, and he was head for Missouri of the Knights of Pythias. Um, so there's a strong Masonic background to many of these people. And I imagine that Eames connected with Skelly on the level of 
uh, sort of some degree of mysticism, geometry, perfection, and uh, history. Anyone else? Yes. So. Uh, an interesting story about the tower is that uh, Pilgrim originally was down in Washington and Ewing in 1867. Yes. And that had a massive tower on it. And when they moved to the new area near Del Mar and Union, they insisted that they have the highest tower in the area of all the churches. And I think that's why Eames's design went over so quickly and so well. <laughs> Interesting. I did not know that. I had looked at some photographs of the prior church, but I didn't realize that it had such a pronounced tower and that that was something that they insisted upon uh, from the architects. I think it was over 200 feet. Yeah, it is very tall. I actually had... Yes? The first one. Wonderful. So thank you for that comment about the history of the tower, he said that uh, the congregation was originally closer to downtown St. Louis and it was, the earlier church was from 1866, 1867, and had a massive tower. And then when they relocated, as many people did, the city kept moving west so when Forest Park was developed for the 1904 World's Fair, many people moved, uh, schools, institutions, churches, all moved to that beautiful area around Forest Park. And this church was built just a few years after that, 1906. Um, so there's a clear connection there. And uh, I'm not sure if there, I'm assuming that there's a connection with the Danforths, and Pilgrim Church, is that correct, Ashley? The Sunday School from 1900 to 1940. Yes. And got sick and tired of the kids not being able to go outside in the winter oh. and said, listen, I'll build you a new chapel right next door, but convert your current chapel on the third floor to a gymnasium in exchange. And they did that. I did not know that. That is wonderful information. Um, it's interesting in part because both Eames, uh, Charles Eames and his wife, Catherine Mormon, taught in the Sunday school. And that is mentioned in her obituary. Uh, she lived, I think, to be 99. And um, some of the things that she mentioned in her obituary, I can only believe that she prepared it. Uh, in advance. Um, she mentioned that she worked with Carl Millis uh, on the uh, meeting of the waters fountain. And after she was divorced from Charles Eames, she married a lighting engineer. He was the lighting designer who lit the fountains of the meeting of the water. So that was an incredibly important uh, piece uh, that uh, Eames contributed to. He worked with Millie's on the site plan. And I've been uh, communicating with Cranbrook and with uh, the Millis Garden in Sweden to find documentation about that. There's one book that shows a site plan which is drawn both by Eames and Millis. And there were some arguments uh, amongst the um, reviewers, uh, there was a lot of public concern about the nudity of the figures, but there were other practical uh, issues that involved uh, subsurface sewers and other things that they had to relocate the fountain because of. Um, and I guess the, I'm assuming that the fountain was unlit for many, many years, and it was only through, I think, Catherine Warman and other people working to raise money and to argue that the fountains really needed to be lit. Uh, one of the amazing things that I noticed when I studied this site plan, and 
I begin to understand uh, Millis' original conception. It was originally called, he called it the marriage of the rivers with a male and female figure, one representing the Mississippi River, one representing the Missouri River. There, were, there was the main basin for all of the figures and uh, fountains. There were two additional water basins, which were to, one was representing the Mississippi and it was to have a huge spray that would envelop all of the figures and another spray coming over the heads of people walking on the sidewalk to cover the, uh, the figures in the fountain. And I think those things were eliminated probably due to cost and uh, safety concerns. The original fountains went incredibly high into the air, I think maybe 50 feet or more. And there were articles in the newspaper about people getting soaked every time the wind blew. And now when you go to see it, and I've photographed it many times, the amount of water that's uh, moving is pretty limited. It's kind of disappointing. Uh, other questions, yes. As, as one who naturally obsesses about mortar, I couldn't help but notice that the, the mortar on the front of the Helena Church is quite quite prominent. And I was wondering if that, in fact, was sort of the intention of Eames, or was that... Uh, the thing that I can tell you is that they have had some water infiltration problems. I mentioned about the mural, uh, and there were some other places... Um, where they had water damage on the interior. So when I examined the church, it appeared that it had been entirely tuck pointed by the Catholic Diocese of uh, Little Rock uh, to, in an effort to protect the church and the bricks. I suspect that the way that those bricks, or were the way that the mortar was struck between those bricks and the coloration of it did not correspond to what Eames originally intended. One of the things that I discovered, I, there was, um, Lisa pointed out that there was an article in the Arkansas Democrat Gazette uh, this past Sunday, uh, which referenced this talk and the two Eames churches, which are both on the National Historic Register. Um, is this fellow who interviewed me for that article had attended that church, just like Richard uh, did as a young man. And he remembers that the front doors of that church were originally uh, covered in gold. And I had no idea about that. But when I look at the black and white photograph, you can see that those doors appear incredibly bright. Um, however, his mother paid to have those doors refinished so that they were wood and not gold. Um, I'm not entirely sure why, but you know, sometimes people have certain beliefs about their church and what it should look like um, that they take very strongly. And uh, I know that there was a series of fairly, let's say, rustic Stations of the Cross that Eames and Charles Quest developed that were positioned all around the walls of the church and uh, similar to the attitude toward the mural, the congregation took them down and put up some that were very elaborate sort of Renaissance painted, uh, you know, Stations of the Cross. So some of the people in the congregation were, you know, talking to me and in a sense complaining that these new uh, fancy Stations of the Cross had replaced the original Eames and Quest designed ones. Yes. Trenta, are there any questions from people uh, online? It's hard to 
say. I don't, I don't think there is any evidence. Okay. Let me, uh, let me try to take a look here. I see Q&A. So, I'm going to get my glasses. Excellent presentation. Who designed the stained glass windows in the Paragold Church? Did Charles Eames design those windows? That is a very good question. I've talked with people uh, at the Emil Fry studio, and when you look at their website, it lists many of the incredible artists who have done work through the studio, which has gone back five generations. Um, and done incredible work all over America and all over the world. Um, so they list Charles Eames as one of those artists, but I haven't gotten any clarity on exactly what he designed. My personal impression is that the sort of more gothic, uh, ornamental, stained glass in the Helena church uh, were done by Emil Fry's studio using sort of the old methods and uh, sort of procedures and forms. And that because the Paragold church had such a limited budget, uh, it required um, simplicity. And I believe Eames helped to design those windows. Uh, when you look at them, uh, you know, this is 1935, 1936, you know, you get an impression of uh, Mondrian and similar kinds of abstract artists. Um, but I, I don't know for sure. It would be great to see some drawings or a letter or a sketch or something. Um, something else that came to my mind. Um, it says, yeah, there, someone's asking a question about Eames and Catherine divorcing. So uh, Charles and Catherine had a daughter, Lucia. Uh, she was born in 1930. So they moved to uh, Bloomfield Hills, Michigan to go to Cranbrook in 1938, I believe September 1938. And they, I found their address in the U.S. Census of 1940. They lived in one of the academic sort of dormitory buildings um, on Academy Road. And so the three of them were there. Uh, I've heard many stories uh, about Eames at Cranbrook. One of the endearing ones is that he would come down to the dining hall wearing his pajamas uh, every morning and, you know, was incredibly active and excited about design, uh, c creating things, and he was doing so many different things at the same time. So he worked with Arrow on an exhibition of faculty work. Uh, he was doing renderings for the Saarinen and Saarinen office. Uh, there are some beautiful renderings that he did of the first Christian church in Columbus, Indiana, perspective drawings. Uh, which show the huge reflecting pool and the interior. Um, and then of course, working on designing chairs. And um, one of my favorite aspects of the story of them designing chairs is that when you look at the boards that they submitted to the Museum of Modern Art and they entered every category and they won first place in two categories. <clears throat> they had done drawings, built models, and photographed those models. 
The models were apparently made by Harry Bertoia, so they were incredibly precise and accurate. And then they built small scenarios with windows and drapes and books and tables and light as if it was in a room, in a home. And apparently the jury believed that they had already built the furniture because the photographs were so convincing. I think Eames understood how to use depth of field uh, to make the model look actually real. Um, whereas most models, you know, end up looking just like a model. Um, but they had an incredible attention to detail in winning those competitions. And I think he learned tremendously from both Saarinen's. Uh, they had won the competition for the Smithsonian in Washington to be built on the mall, which was just a beautiful modernist design. They built an incredible model. They had actual sculptures and paintings in the model for you know the jury to review. They won the competition, but of course, World War II interrupted all of that. Um, okay, we're gonna finish up. It's almost eight o'clock. Um, I will be happy to address and answer questions uh, that people have posed on the Q&A. And anyone who would like to contact me, you can look at uh, andrewramus.com and I'll have a link to the PDF and uh, you can sign up. I have a, a newsletter, a monthly newsletter, talking about all of the new research and the new things that I'm finding out uh, as I'm putting this book, Becoming Charles Eames, together. So thank you all very much for coming. I appreciate everyone who came down on a cold night and everyone who signed up to watch online. Uh, it has been a great honor. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Thanks for coming, everybody. Happy holidays. Drive safe.